Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. As we mentioned earlier, House Republicans have just put out their report rebutting any wrongdoing by the president in his dealings with Ukraine in a new report. And that is not the only way Republicans plan to counter the Democratic-controlled impeachment hearings. Republicans say they will do everything they can to gum up the works as the committee weighs articles of impeachment. They have the majority, and I suspect they're going to continue to run right over us. And they seem, quite frankly, they haven't been concerned with what the rules have been uh, too much anyway. And so uh, we're going to have to keep fight for every bit of ground we get. We won't be like a speed bump. We'll be like a, a stop stick with spikes on it, trying to, <laughs> to put a flat tire on that truck running over us. Joining me now, Illinois Democratic Congressman Mike Quigley. He's a member of the House Intelligence Committee. Congressman, always good to see you. Um, the Thank Republicans you. have released their version of uh, their impeachment report, which exonerates the president on everything. We've just been talking about it. I do want to uh, read a, a paragraph at the heart of this. They're saying there is also nothing wrong with asking serious questions about the presence of Vice President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, on the board of directors of Burisma, a corrupt Ukrainian company, or about you. Ukraine's attempts to influence the 2016 presidential election. How do you argue when the Republicans are arguing that? It's tough. Uh, I just have to deal with an alternative reality. Bottom line, my Republican colleagues, when they live in the president's world, they have to live in his alternative world of reality. And we just have to address that. It's tough when the facts don't matter and when the law doesn't matter. All you can do is speak directly to the American people, as I think we will in the coming weeks as well. How do you speak directly to the American people when the American people are not they're Not everybody's following along with these hearings in real time on C-SPAN. They're getting their news either from social media or they're getting their news from an outlet that skews to one side or another. They're getting their their facts pushed through an opinionated sieve. So how do you keep it clear? As much as you possibly can through your own constituents and, and through opportunities like this. You know, we, we grew fond of the expression quid pro quo, uh, certainly Latin, but I think what we try to do now is uh, another Latin phrase, res ipsa loquitur. It speaks for itself. Uh, the president's abuse of power speaks for itself. His own words, do me a favor, right? Plain speaking language, his chief of staff's own language, the testimony that is clear and consistent and corroborating of each other of the cream of our diplomatic corps, that the president of the United States upheld military aid and a visit to the White House uh, to gain personally. And I don't expect that I'm going to convince the president's base. It's, it's not my intention. And I don't know that I necessarily, beyond just uh, educating the uh, Democratic base, I think it's those folks in the middle. We learned a long time ago that most elections are decided by a single-digit number of Americans in the middle. Uh, I'm speaking to them and anyone else who will listen in a clear method uh, of at least trying to let them know what the facts are. Do you expect anything to be different in the Senate if it makes it there? 
I can only hope that they'll get past the, the fact that they believe party is more important than country. We're in the 25th anniversary of the Budapest Agreement. This was a commitment that the signatories gave to protect uh, Ukraine when they give up their nuclear weapons. The fact that uh, Fiona Hill spoke so well of this in her testimony, that uh, providing other secure, the, the uh, conspiracy theories that we're talking about here, uh, given that any credence, as the Republicans are doing, is giving material aid to the Russians, and it is hurting us and our own national security. All I can do is speak to as many Americans as will listen as to what the facts are, what the ramifications are, and hope that the senators will get past their party, the fact that their primaries are coming up soon, and they're worried about staying in office. Let me ask you this. I'm going to read another portion from the Republican report. They say the Democrats' impeachment inquiry is not the organic outgrowth of serious misconduct. It is an orchestrated campaign to upend our political system, the Republicans wrote. The Democrats are trying to impeach a duly elected president based on the accusations and assumptions of unelected bureaucrats who disagreed with President Trump's policy initiatives and processes. Okay, do you believe that if you had more time and more ability to call more witnesses, maybe perhaps witnesses that had direct conversations with the president, people like Mulvaney, people like Bolton, people like Giuliani, the people who could be forced to testify under a court order down the line, that you would be able to get more headway in this impeachment inquiry and potentially convince more people that it is the right move? You know, I'm not sure if I can ever convince people in the core Republican Trump base in this new world. We grew up in a world where so people would say... So what do we do going forward? If you can't convince somebody <clears throat> of the facts in front of them, if you can't convince somebody it's snowing out when it's snowing, where do we go from here, Congressman? Does that mean that Washington is is fundamentally broken? How do you work with well, that? I, I think it's an issue of polarization. Uh, as I was saying, I think we grew up in a world when the people would say, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. And now it's the other way around. You know, I'll see it when I believe it. Uh, and the best we can do is push back against that and remind folks of, of why it matters. There's nothing else left for us to do than to speak truth to the American people and, and hope that we can build, and I think we can, a majority that wants to move forward and get things done. But to my Republican colleagues, no one forced the President of the United States to obstruct the investigation. No one put him on the phone and said, you're going to call President Zelensky and hold back military aid in exchange for a White House visit or, or hold back a White House visit in exchange for a political gain. No one made him do that. That was his own actions. Whether they want to call it organic or not, it was wrong. I can't look and say, well, if I can't convince the president's base or the Senate, I shouldn't do this. The bottom line is this was wrong. It has to be pointed out. The Constitution didn't say if the Senate agrees, you should move forward or whether or not the poll on the Republican base supports you or not. It says you should do the right thing. At least we can sleep at night, look ourselves in the, in the mirror and think and understand that we're doing the right thing. It is Tuesday, the 3rd of December of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. Oh, just a small scant dash, a mere pinch of hot smoked Hungarian paprika will make all the difference in the world. Well, it looks like tomorrow we're going to have, as they say, the uh, feces will be hitting the fan. Oh, indeed. Uh, ostensibly, we're supposed to get the articles of impeachment tonight. I don't think that they're going to have them. I, I think Schiff on uh, Rachel uh, last evening uh, intimated that it would be more towards uh, the end of the day, if not a bit later. And uh, then the debate on what impeachment is and how these articles of impeachment apply will begin tomorrow morning in the judiciary. So, uh, <laughs> I guess, like I said, uh, it's all coming to a head. Uh, Trump refuses to admit that it's happening. Uh, he's like the little kid who covers up his ears and 
closes his eyes and goes la 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 because he doesn't want to hear the bad news. And why would he? <laughs> because it's pretty bad. And it looks like also the whole of the GOP party uh, thinks that the only way to defend Trump is to pour gasoline all over themselves and light it on fire and say, look, <laughs> is it a distraction? No, they're they're just going to light a fire and uh, say they back Russia. <laughs> why? Why are why is everybody being so mean to Russia? Uh huh. That's essentially their their position right now is that we have it out for Russia. And I would say, yes, we do because Vladimir Putin has been a bad actor in all of this. And we have a story at the end of the day about how it all ties in and how even in a criminal proceeding, if you just say, I'm not going to take part in that, I don't accept its legitimacy. You pretty much can get away with anything. And now we have a president of the United States doing essentially the same thing. I will just not accept the legitimacy of this rule of law. Because, look, <laughs> when you're president, you've been appointed by God. Ask Bill Barr. He's got the legal analysis right now that shows it. Yeah, Bill Barr is holding up and going to uh, disagree with the IG report that, well... It was Russia, not Ukraine. And there were no uh, FBI agents or anybody else who was trying to, you know, gum up the works and go after Trump illegally. They were after a legitimate investigation of Russia attacking the United States. So now we have, and I have to say, this term Vichy Republicans <laughs> I guess I need to push my copyright claims a lot more and quicker and all of it. Because Vichy Republicans was coined a couple of years ago. All right, let's be clear. I will say that the sheer number of Vichy Republicans elected Vichy Republicans have increased. Not by necessarily being elected, but by uh, finding out that uh, apparently they got stuff on them, too. And what is it? I would say NRA laundered Russian rubles that have been uh, exchanged for U.S. dollars. A lot of them. Takes a lot of rubles to make some Dallas. I've heard that argument. Oh, well, a ruble isn't worth that much. Yeah, well, let me put it this way. When you're a Russian guy and you can plop down cash, oh, about 10 million, 15 million over asking to launder your money through some Trump property. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> takes a lot of rubles, doesn't it, to get that amount out there? Yeah, I think the the uh, estate or uh, was about five million, uh, seven million. The guy plopped down. Oh, I don't know some ungodly number. But it was well over, you know, 10 to 15 mil over asking. I guess he really wanted it. Jeez. Well, uh, uh, yeah, it takes a lot of rubles to be able to pay 10 to 15 mil over asking in U.S. dollars. So you can take that argument and go away. <laughs> and I am still getting uh, the the uh, pushback from the usual suspects on the Southern Oregon Facebook community pages that uh, I monitor as well as I can since I've been muted and blocked. Yeah, that's their strategy. Anybody who lifts up their head and says, well, this is a troll or a bot or both, uh, you can af uh, they can effectively block you and silence you. Because <laughs> the more voices against them, somebody might actually look into it. Yeah, I was actually attacked by uh, a recent uh, entity. Now, once again, I just take people at their face value. You know, if they say they're from the area, I just accept it. Now, it turns out that this uh, this particular uh, interlocutor is from probably another country, if not another state of Oregon. 
uh, I thought it was rather odd some of the knee jerk defenses of Trump and everything right wing and white. And the this particular one actually takes on the personality traits of some of uh, the right wing neo Nazi proud boy types here. I don't know what it is. They got into pot growing. A lot of neo Nazi pot growers here in Southern Oregon. Makes you wonder. And I'm not just you know putting that out there as hyperbole. Uh, there was a testing lab. Um, whose principal ownership were neo-Nazis. And they were outed and put out of business. And a lot of people came through their defense like, well, just because they're neo-Nazis doesn't mean that they're not testing the pot right. Well, I don't want neo-Nazis testing my pot, please. Thank you very much. Also, there was a pancake breakfast a couple of year, a couple of weeks ago. Um, what was it? Not Weimer. Maybe it was Weimer. But a small little village here has a yearly pancake breakfast uh, at their, you know, their main part of their little town, their little village, uh, to raise money for the kids, for the youth center and a few other things. And it was uh, canceled this year because a uh, group of neo-Nazis who took over a farmer's market were discovered, and I have to say, all the people that took me to task for pointing out that the local high school kids who flashed the Pepe white nationalist sign during the class senior picture should have been spoken to, and I was attacked for being, well, divisive, uh, for pointing out that, you know, something that didn't exist, you know, these neo-Nazis don't exist. Then I had some proud boys threaten me. Well, yeah, you could try. I don't threaten that easily, but, uh, you know, that's what they do. And, uh, uh, yeah, it was not a good thing. And now all those same people, not the proud boys, proud boys are, are defending the armed insurrection in this little town that prevented them from having their pancake breakfast because they feared bloodshed. And not just because, Oh, there's little scaredy cats and snowflakes because they were uh, threatened actually threatened and there is an investigation going on and everybody knows who these people are that did the threatening. So they don't like it. They didn't like uh, about what happened in their growers farmers market takeover and when they were outed and kicked out. So now they're going to shut down a whole town. The town fathers were afraid of having the pancake breakfast because there would be mostly kids there. All right. Well, as I intimated, uh, the the same people who took me to task are now up in arms. Like, how could this happen? How could uh, why, why did we know about this? Well, when people tell you about it, don't kick them out just because they're the crazy liberal. All right. I know you moved from California to get away from all those crazy liberals. And why did why, why are they here in Oregon? <laughs> Because some of us were born here, all right? Just letting you know. Well, what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays? Well, at the top, that was a little discussion about when it comes to impeachment. Some members of Congress say they have no intention to convince the president's base to suddenly now leave Trump's alternative reality and join the real world. I should mention that the Netris Radio Style Manual really does preclude us from using the P word when uh, attributed to Trump. But this was a direct quote, the president's base, so I had to put it in. I had to. On the rest of the menu, anti-vaxxers targeted the island of Samoa, and now 32 kids are dead from the measles. On the rest of the menu here, in the answer to a question about FaceApp, the FBI says it considers any mobile app developed in Russia to be a potential counterintelligence threat. Well, don't tell Tucker Carlson. He'll think that it's a good thing. And DHS wants to face scan all U.S. citizens entering or leaving the United States. Big brother much? <laughs> After the break, we move to the chef's table where a Honduran court 
handed down 50-year jail sentences for seven men convicted of the 2016 murder of indigenous and climate activist Berta Caceres. And in violation of European law, Russia refused a Dutch request to hand over a suspect in the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the rightish of the page is our chat room link, monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. You will then notice the uh, link to our Patreon page. And uh, do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. It really does help us mitigate paying bills and accumulating funds to buy the ever-needed newish machinery. Boy, I better do that quick. Oh, man. Still need some more money, but I'm getting it. Thank you very much. I also want to thank those who have uh, recently become Patreons. I thought there was a way to make a one-time donation of a lump sum, but... um, uh, I'll look into that further. I was uh, uh, given some information that there's not really a way to do that other than uh, putting in a recurring uh, contribution and uh, then just discontinuing it when you reach your limit. So do that and uh, or just continue with a recurring contribution to us, which many have done over these many years. And it has been that generosity that really has allowed us to continue resisting as the founders originally intended even before the U.S. Constitution was ratified, let alone signed. All right. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. And you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Coast about 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, then get that linked up on social media for your social media linking pleasure or leaking l- linkage. There you go. Linkage. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. And most importantly, pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. Etc., 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 etc. Well, before we get into uh, this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe, uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasies, Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays, that is our daily special. Looks like Macron has uh, slapped uh, Trump pretty hard on live international television. Apparently, Trump threatened to send some ISIS fighters that uh, he's. You know, had the Turks and the Syrians release. He's going to send them into France to, I don't know, uh, disrupt this uh, digital tax that uh, France and a few other countries are imposing on Google and and Facebook and others. So he wants uh, terrorist activities to occur because of some sort of trade dispute. <laughs> and Macron slapped him hard on live international TV. And all I can say is, um, messy. All right. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Washington Post. And it is by uh, Ben Guarino, Nina Satya, and Lena H. Soon. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is immediately sending experts in response to a request from the Samoan government for assistance with a measles outbreak 
that has sickened almost 2,500 people and killed 32 mostly children. The CDC is providing technical assistance with tracking and monitoring of cases and vaccinations campaigns. And two CDC experts are expected to be on the ground shortly. Vaccination rates in Samoa are among the lowest in the world. And the country has been the target of anti-vaccine activists. Because they're doing an experiment, and you know what? It actually will kill people if you don't vaccinate them. I wonder if that's the feature not the bug, especially when anti-vaccination efforts are being funded and promulgated by, yes, hostile foreign actors by the name of Vladimir Putin. The, the measles outbreak was declared October 16th and is spreading rapidly throughout the island with unprecedented severity. Children under five account for nearly half the cases of being infected and dead. In late November, the Pacific nation closed schools nationwide and indefinitely banned children younger than 17 from public gatherings. The number of measles cases represents more than 1% of the population of nearly 200,000. Measles is one of the most contagious diseases known. It can cause serious health complications such as pneumonia or encephalitis and death. Two doses of the vaccine for measles, mumps, and rubella are 97% effective in preventing measles, and I've been kicked in the teeth by anti-vaxxers here because the 3% is what we're worried about. Really now. The high number of recent infections indicates that the Samoan crisis is far from over. The health ministry said, 243 cases were reported in the previous 24 hours. Anonymous worker bees out of Reuters bring us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. The Federal Bureau of Investigation considers any mobile app developed in Russia to be a, quote, potential counterintelligence threat, end quote, it said yesterday, responding to a U.S. lawmaker's query about face editing photo app FaceApp. The viral smartphone app saw a surge in popularity this year due to a filter that ages photos of users' faces. You know, that's a total Twilight Zone episode. The original ones with Rod Serling? I am serious. Wow. Russia developed an app that ages your face. And then when people look in the mirror? Yeah. I'm telling you, it could be a, it could be a Rod Serling era Twilight Zone. Concerns about its Russian provenance prompted the DNC to warn the party's 2020 presidential candidates against using it, as well as a call from Democratic U.S. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer for the FBI and the FTC to conduct national security reviews. There is no evidence that FaceApp provides user data to the Russian government, which means that they're, that because they don't have the evidence, <laughs> it means they're not going to release the fact that it is. And they got plenty of evidence. Sounds to me like that's that uh, part of the report's been barred. Indeed. Uh, but the FBI, in a letter responding to Schumer, said Moscow's ability to ability to access communications directly through uh, internet service providers makes any app built there risky. Russia's intelligence services maintain robust cyber exploitation capabilities, the FBI said, and are able under local laws to remotely access all communications and servers on Russian networks without making a request to the ISPs. You know, Trump wants that. 
Face App, which launched in 2017, was developed by Wireless Lab, a company based in St. Petersburg. Its chief executive officer, Yaroslav Goncharov, used to be an executive at Yandex, widely known as Russia's Google. The company has denied selling or sharing user data with third parties, but that's what the whole idea of these uh, entities are. You are the product. Come on. And uh, data is never transferred to Russia. Yeah. And most images are deleted from its servers within 48 hours of submission because they're already in the KGB server and they don't need it on FaceApp anymore. of Reuters brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Trump administration intends to propose a regulation next year that would require all travelers, including U.S. citizens, to be photographed when entering or leaving the United States. The proposed regulation, slated to be issued in July by the Homeland Security Department, would be part of a broader system to track travelers as they enter and exit the United States. The plan has already drawn opposition from some privacy advocates. Jay Stanley, a senior policy analyst with the American Civil Liberties Union, blasted the idea. Well, I wouldn't call the ACLU just a privacy advocate. I think they're an advocate for the Constitution of the United States. You might say that, maybe. Travelers, including U.S. citizens, should not have to submit to invasive biometric scans simply as a condition of exercising their constitutional right to travel. Uh, That was, uh, once again, Jay Stanley of the ACLU. Now, the Trump administration contends in its regulatory agenda that the face scan requirement will combat the fraudulent use of U.S. travel documents and aid the identification of criminals and suspected terrorists. Wait, this sounds like a dragnet. That is illegal and unconstitutional. Oh, I know they have the pullover spots to get DUI drivers off the roads. And that is constitutionally questionable, let's be clear. U.S. Customs and Border Protection, which is part of DHS, has already conducted pilot programs that collect photographs and fingerprints from foreign travelers. Oh, and should I mention journalists so they can harass them for hours when they try to go in and out of the United States? Oh, you're a journalist? We have to keep you here because you are an enemy of the state. A 2018 internal audit found technical and operational problems during the pilot program at nine U.S. airports. The problems raised questions about whether DHS would meet a self-imposed deadline to confirm all foreign departures at the top 20 U.S. airports by fiscal year 2021. The nonpartisan Pew Research Center estimated in 2006 that 45% of immigrants in the United States without legal status entered on a valid visa, but did not depart when it expired. Oh, so what you're saying is that they came in on legal documents, but you want to photograph them and everybody so that you can harass them later in case they didn't leave in the right amount of time? And American citizens will be caught up in the dragnet and deported as well. You mean sort of like what's happening now. 
all right, we better fix this and fix it quick. And you know one way to do that? Yeah, it starts with I and ends with impeachment. (laughs) Okay, let's get to our break. And when we come back from that break, we are going to go through weather from around the world. And we are going to finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. Hi, I'm Scientific American podcast editor Steve Mursky. And here's a short piece from the November 2019 issue of the magazine in the section called Advances, Dispatches from the Frontiers of Science, Technology, and Medicine. The article is titled Quick Hits, and it's a rundown of some science and technology stories from around the globe, compiled by editorial intern Jennifer Lehman. From Canada, in the famed Burgess Shale Rock Formation, paleontologists discovered hundreds of fossils of a horseshoe crab-shaped predator that lived in the ocean 506 million years ago. It measured up to a foot long. From Tanzania, marine biologists discovered a colorful fish species dubbed the Vibranium fairy wrasse during a biodiversity assessment of largely unstudied deep reefs off Zanzibar's coast. From Colombia, Scientists confirmed a destructive fungus targeting banana plants has arrived in the country. No treatment is available, so officials put potentially infected crops under quarantine to stop its spread. From Mexico, researchers have rationed electricity and cut temporary employees' jobs after Mexico's president lowered funding for federal institutions by 30 to 50 percent in certain budget items including those supported by the National Council of Science and Technology. And from Cameroon and Equatorial Guinea, scientists found that goliath frogs, which are Earth's largest living frogs and can be longer than an American football, construct protected ponds for their young by pushing heavy rocks across streams. They live only in this region. That was Quick Hits by Jennifer Lehman. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. Occasional aches and pains are an expected part of life, but for many people, pain is a constant companion. Dr. Chad Helmick is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. He's joining us today to discuss ways to manage chronic pain. Welcome to the show, Chad. Thank you. Chad, how many people in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain? In 2016, 50 million adults had chronic pain, which is pain on most or every day in the past six months. More interesting, though, is that 20 million people have high-impact chronic pain, which is chronic pain that also limits their work or life activities on most every day in the past six months. This is a problem because chronic pain is associated not only with symptoms, but with anxiety and depression, reduced quality of life, and the risk of opioid problems. What are the most common causes of chronic pain? The most common causes generally relate to bones and joints, like low back pain and arthritis, but there are many other causes, headaches, sickle cell disease, fibromyalgia, surgery and injuries, and many, many others. Is chronic pain more common in any particular group of people? Yes, it's, uh, it occurs at all ages, but it's more common in um, older middle-aged adults and in the oldest old, 85 and older. It's also more common in women, poor people, and those who live in rural areas. How is chronic pain treated? Well, the first thing to do is to get a diagnosis, which can help guide treatment. But the thinking about chronic pain now is it becomes a chronic disease by itself, regardless of the cause, and that can cause significant problems. The real goal in management is to have a manageable level of pain, not to get rid of all pain. 
There's several steps that can be taken, and these are sometimes difficult to do because of barriers to access. But it makes sense to do the simplest and safest things first. And these are non-drug steps. Things like physical activity, walking is perfectly good to help reduce pain. Also, self-management education can give you some confidence in managing chronic pain when you're on your own. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, psychological therapy, better sleep, which usually means less alcohol, and seeing a chiropractor or getting biofeedback and massage. If that's not enough, non-opioid drugs like Tylenol or Motrin and Advil or Naproxen or Aleve can help. If those don't work, then it's time to consider something stronger. Sometimes that's opioids, but there's not great evidence that opioids are good for long-term pain in most people. Do you have any advice for people suffering from chronic pain? Well, it's important to work with a variety of providers who are working together to help you. Uh, The goal, again, is manageable pain so you can live a productive life. This can include physical therapy. Most people can walk to treat any underlying depression or anxiety and to avoid further injuries. Finally, the National Pain Strategy is laying out a strategic roadmap to improve pain management system in this country. Where can listeners get more information about managing chronic pain? Listeners can go to the NIH website, nih.gov, and type in National Pain Strategy. Thanks, Chad. I've been talking today with Dr. Chad Helmick about ways to manage chronic pain. If you're experiencing daily pain, talk with your healthcare provider to ensure you have the correct diagnosis and know how to manage your condition. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. I'm probably okay to have one more drink before I drive home. I'm probably okay. I open the window to stay alert. Probably okay. I just popped some gum in my mouth. Step out of the car, please. I probably made a mistake. Probably okay isn't okay when it comes to drinking and driving. If you see a warning sign, stop and call a cab, a car, or a friend. Buzz driving is drunk driving. A message brought to you by NHTSA and the Ad Council. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets and you. You are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution, and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1916. That was the day that seven Australian members of the Industrial Workers of the World were sentenced to 15 years in prison for their anti-war efforts during World War I. Other IWW members were sentenced to as many as five and ten years each. The IWW had led the way in protesting the use of the draft, or what was called conscription during World War I. On August 10, 1914, the front page of the Australian IWW newspaper, Direct Action, had declared war for what? For the workers and their dependents, death, starvation, poverty, and untold misery. For the capitalist class, gold, stained with the blood of millions, riotous luxury, banquets of jubilation over the graves of their dupes and slaves. An Australian wobbly leader, Tom Barker, had urged, let those who own Australia do the fighting. Put the wealthiest in the front ranks. The middle class next. Follow these with politicians, lawyers, sky pilots, and judges. Answer the declaration of war with a call for a general strike. 
Barker was arrested and jailed more than once for his stance on the war. In 1916, Australians had grown increasingly weary of the fighting. They voted no in a referendum on the continued use of conscription. That September 1916, the government raided IWW offices and arrested key leaders. The leaders were sentenced to long prison terms. Nine months later, the IWW was outlawed in Australia. The membership roles were made available to employers who blacklisted anyone on the lists. Continued involvement in the IWW could result in six months hard labor in the work camps. This government oppression took a sharp toll on the union. But to its credit, the IWW still exists in Australia to this day. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. If it's Tuesday, it's report time. The House Intelligence Committee is expected to vote on and publicly release its impeachment inquiry report based on the two weeks of hearings just completed. The report, said to be approximately 175 pages long, should lay out their case that Trump's effort to pressure Ukraine to announce investigations of his political rivals was an abuse of power that warrants his removal from office. Republicans Monday evening released their minority report, basically saying there's nothing to see here. Move right along. CNN's Aaron Burnett and Dana Bash were incredulous. The president said it himself, Dana. And yet Nunes and Jordan have come out with a report saying the facts aren't the facts. Black is white, up is down. I mean, it's where we are, unfortunately, and it just doesn't match with the reality that's in front of our face that the president himself said. So, you know, they took this report, maybe not just two steps too far, 10 steps too far, because they can, because they believe that they can get away with it with the people that they care about, the Republican base. And the current state of affairs shows that they're not wrong. The next phase of the impeachment inquiry begins Wednesday morning at 10 Eastern with the first hearing in the Judiciary Committee. This will be an academic exercise with law professors explaining the legal points of impeachment and high crimes and misdemeanors. There's another report expected in the next week or so. This one from the Department of Justice's Inspector General regarding the much-touted investigation into the oranges, the oranges of the uh, uh, investigation, the beginnings of that investigation. Right. The origins of the Russia investigation. Well, in a sort of a pre-buttle, Attorney General Bill Barr told associates he disagrees with the tone of the key findings in the report most notably that the FBI had enough information in July of 2016 to justify launching an investigation into members of the Trump campaign. Attorney General William Barr has reportedly told associates he disagrees with the Justice Department's inspector general on one of the key findings in his anticipated report. According to the Washington Post, Barr has not been convinced of DOJ Inspector General Michael Horowitz's conclusion that the FBI had appropriate grounds to launch the investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016, according to people familiar with the matter. The inspector general report is currently being finalized and will be released next week. The attorney general has faced criticism in the past for publicly defending the president and for giving off the appearance of not being completely impartial. It is unclear how Barr will react publicly, but it is a standard practice for every inspector general report to include a written response from the department. Former Justice Department spokesman Matt Miller tweeted about the report, quote, Unreal, it is not uncommon for an AG to disagree with an IG finding because it is too tough on the DOJ. I have never heard of an IG confirming the department did things correctly and an AG disputing it. Just shocking partisan behavior. Donald Trump is in London for a NATO meeting. Early Tuesday morning, he sat alongside NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg for a 53-minute session where he rambled incoherently to the assembled press. For example, on impeachment, Trump said, It's a hoax. The impeachment thing is a hoax. It's turned out to be a hoax. It's done for purely political gain. They're going to see whether or not they can do something in 2020 because otherwise they're going to lose. 
This is such typical Trump speak. He's got the intelligence and reasoning skills of a 10-year-old. For example, take the word hoax. Merriam-Webster defines hoax as an act intended to trick or dupe or something accepted or established by fraud or fabrication. The impeachment process is not a hoax at all. It's a legitimate procedure being debated and voted on by the House of Representatives, as outlined in the United States Constitution. What is a hoax is Donald Trump's presidency. Just saying. The Supreme Court on Monday heard its first Second Amendment case in almost 10 years. This case concerns a New York City ordinance that limited the transport of guns outside an owner's home. Fearing a loss in the Supreme Court, to say nothing of a broad ruling from the court's conservative majority on what the Second Amendment protects, the city repealed the ordinance and now argues that the case is moot. But the court may be ready to end its decade of silence, elaborate on the meaning of the Second Amendment, and in the process, tell the lower courts whether they have been faithful to the message of the 2008 Heller decision. Now we wait. Two more Democrats have left the race. Admiral Joe Sestak and Montana Governor Steve Bullock both ended their presidential bids on Monday. And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and The Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener supported, and I can't do it without your help. So on this Giving Tuesday, please visit NicoleSandler.com. Click on that donate button. And thank you. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently hmm, 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Winds are a negligible one mile per hour. They call that light and variable. Out of the due east... So we're kind of cold. Some clouds this morning will give way to generally sunny skies in the afternoon after areas of dense fog in which the uh, mothership resides currently. Dense fog all around. Uh, High should be around 57. We'll see if it gets that warm. Overnight lows in the mid to low 30s. And of course, light winds will be light and variable. And we'll continue tomorrow with a high of around, oh, 55 or less. Pollen is rated at none. The air quality index is in the good range at 35 parts per million, and the daytime UV index remains low at 1. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.21 inches. Visibility is down to 5 miles. Of course, here at the mothership, it's, I don't know, about 300 feet or less. And relative humidity is at 92%, which is expected with this kind of dense fog. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. That is my pee tape. So if you're going to pop your peas, now's the time to do it. London is 48 and sunny. Paris is 41 and mostly cloudy. Rome is 57 and mostly cloudy. Kiev is 30 and mostly cloudy. Kabul is 40 degrees with smoke. Wow. Hong Kong is 57 and fair. Tokyo is 50 degrees and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 68 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 51 and partly cloudy. And New York, New York is 33 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny, but with a freeze warning. So take care walking around the slippery streets of the Big Apple.
And that is Weather from Around the World, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. Gustavo Palencia brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Terry Town Chowder Tuesdays. A Honduran court handed down jail terms of up to five decades for seven men, convicted of the 2016 murder of indigenous activist Berta Caceres, who led a battle against a major dam on the ancestral lands of her Lenca tribe. Five of those accused of the murder were sentenced to 50 years in jail and another two to a term of 30 years, said court spokeswoman Lucia Villars. Honduran law gives the men 20 days to appeal the sentences. Caceres, shot to death at her home in the town of La Esperanza, was a veteran land rights activist who started out in the early 1990s setting her sights on illegal logging. Since 2006, she had organized opposition to the $50 million Agua Zarca hydroelectric dam, which, where building came to a halt after completing as much as a fifth of the project. Lenca activists criticized the dam on the, Guada, on the Gualcarque River for what they said would probably cause major disruptions to their food and water supply and fault of the project for a lack of required indigenous consultations. Those already convicted include an employee of the Honduran project operator, De Sarlos and Energinicos, or DESA, an active duty military officer and a retired officer who is a DESA employee. While DESA ran the project... Chinese-owned Sino Hydro, one of the world's largest dam developers, was originally contracted to build it, but eventually backed out in 2013. Je te donne mon amour pour la vie entière. La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes Quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire, je te donne tous mes hivers. Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Russia has refused a Dutch request to hand over a suspect in the downing of Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 in violation of European law. Volodymyr Tasmaka. A Ukrainian national had been identified as a suspect by the Netherlands, which is leading an investigation into the disaster on July 17th of 2014, which killed all 298 people aboard. Two-thirds of the passengers were Dutch. MH17 was shot out of the sky over territory held by pro-Russian separatists in eastern Ukraine as it flew from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Investigators say the missile that hit the airline came from a launcher transported from a Russian military base in Kursk just across the border. And of course, Moscow has denied all wrongdoing because it was really the Ukraine that hacked into the U.S. elections in 2016. And what happened in 2014 has no bearing because really all Moscow was doing was saving their own Sudetenland. 
Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speaking. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au langue de golf clair Ton bras les yeux ouverts Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Oh, je te vivais.